Bromeyer Award Lecture for the 2012 Bromeyer Award for Music Composition. I think we figured out today this is the 26th such presentation since the award um, started in 1985 with Vitaly Zaslavsky. I skipped a couple of years, but Mr. Salomon is, I believe, our 26th recipient of this award. Um, I'm not going to go over Esoteca and Salomon's very impressive bio, since you should have it in front of you. But I would like to say that in an era where music, like so many other professions, is increasingly specialized, Mr. Salomon has bucked that trend. Obviously, at the pinnacle of his profession as a composer, he is also one of the most in-demand conductors in the world, having recently completed a phenomenally successful 12-year-old, 17-year stint as music director of the Los Angeles Philharmonic, where he built a large and diverse audience based on innovative programming that celebrated living composers. He is currently serving as chief conductor of the Philharmonia Orchestra in London, among other conducting engagements. Um, I would like to invite everyone to the master classes he is giving tomorrow and Thursday. We're going to have master classes in which student conductors are conducting pieces by student composers. And Mr. Salomon is going to give master sort of um, joint master class for those. I would say that this is something that very few music schools in the country are going to be able to offer their students this year. So this is a very special thing indeed. Um, the time tomorrow is 12.30 to 4 in Comstock Hall. It's open to the public, but come and go quietly, please. And Thursday, 12.30 to 3 in Comstock Hall is when these sessions will be held. So please try uh, to get to some of that. I think it will be fascinating. And at this point, I would like to ask Dr. Naomi Oliphant, the Associate Dean of the School of Music, to present Mr. Salonen with his award. Award. 
And the, I've been in this business for, for decades, of course, and, and, um, and um, I'm very experienced in this way, but still, we can use that sort of an acknowledgement, certainly. And I thought, all right, I might be on the right path, and um, I'll work even harder to achieve my goals uh, within whatever amount of time has been left for me. I'll work harder than ever before. And the other thing, of course, uh, a purely personal, personal re reflection uh, is that when I looked at the list of previous recipients, it was like uh, most of those people uh, were either uh, the great and important uh, central influences of my, in my life, or my mentors, such as Lubezwalski, or my friends, such as John Adams, Kaya Salviapo, uh, Brett Dean, Louis Andreessen, and so on so forth. So it really, really was the group of people in, in the musical world that I the most admired of all. And now I became part of that very, very, very distinguished group of people. And, and I have no words to say how proud I am. Now, I thought that I would read you an article I wrote some time ago, uh, and it's about immortality, which of course is a totally uninteresting subject <laughs> for the ones who are immortal. They are kind of beyond it anyway. Uh, but for us, mortals, there is some interest in that as a sort of a project uh, or as a sort of theoretical subject. Um, and after this, uh, we are going to see a <coughs> video recording of my violin concerto from Paris last year. And then I can take questions from the floor if anybody is curious about anything at all. Immortality guaranteed. The history of Western thinking is full of fanatical and heroic searches for the ultimate truth. A single concentrated formula that would forever solve the fundamental riddle of our existence. The whys and wherefores. I'm tempted to believe that this need to distill the overwhelming complexity of what we call the world into simple rules is indeed one of the very basic human instincts. This yearning for clarity and predictability manifests itself on all levels of human activities. Alchemists wanted to find the formula for creating gold from non-precious metals. Countless hopefuls have over centuries tried to create a magic potion for eternal life. The greatest trophy in today's quantum physics would undeniably belong to the discoverer of the theory of all. The list is endless. Yet there is something that unites all these pursuits. The urge to control the frightening, the uncontrollable, by the power of beauty. The beauty of clarity, simplicity and transparency. To fight chaos with aesthetics. And yet the history of these heroic projects is one of failures. Ultimate failures despite some encouraging moments and temporary victory. Think of Newtonian physics, for instance, a beautiful, complete, perfect system that has been replaced with hopelessly elusive and utterly incomprehensible new cosmologies, string theories with 17 dimensions and counting. This kind of thinking is by no means alien to the arts. There have been periods of all artistic creation being subject to rigid rules as a divine or magical uh, guarantee of quality. Alternating with times more relaxed, more individualistic. Just think of the miniature painters of the Ottoman Empire, so beautifully described by Orhan Pamuk in My Name is Red. The best of them were blind and thus not tempted by the physical reality around them. A blind painter could concentrate on depicting the eternal truth, obeying the rules. All composers share the dream of writing a perfect 
and, and therefore immortal piece of music at some point in their lives. We all know that only a frighteningly small fraction of, of all music enters that category. It is statistically utterly unlikely that anyone in this room would ever achieve that towering but elusive goal. Why elusive? Just look at the canon. What do the B minor mass and Petrushka have in common? Why green sleeves and yesterday? Why not some other of the thousands or millions of songs sung by somebody, somebody somewhere? Very clearly, if there's a magic potion for musical longevity, it's, a recipe, it's recipe must be frustrate, frustratingly complicated. Or maybe it is something so simple we just can't see. Columbus egg, anyone? All of us who studied Palestrina style counterpoint at some point can relate to this. I remember my complete astonishment when my teacher declared one melodic line good and other, another one dismal. Just like that, off the bat. This judgment had nothing to do with I, the creator, trying to convey, nor was it based on my teacher's emotional or physical reaction as the audience. It was simply a function of a melody more or less successfully following the rules of the style. How frustrating and liberating at the same time. Quality in music no longer elusive, but clearly within reach through hard work and willingness and ability to follow rules. This Palestrina style is, of course, a construct. The master himself would have been astonished by the rigid but simplistic matrix, which he himself did not follow, as he did not know such thing existed. The same thing can be said of Bach's style choral harmony and the sonata form. The list is long. These systems are nevertheless innocuous and useful, as they are respected tools in learning and understanding the way that real music works. Here we encounter the very topic of this spe little speech of mine. It is generally understood that during study we are supposed to analyze and sometimes directly copy, or at least imitate established masterpieces. Later we must break all rules, develop our own individual voice and create art that has value and integrity without the straitjacket of an artificial value system. Sounds familiar? In reality, things are a lot less simple. There seem to be two kinds of mechanisms that define good music at, at the moment or directly after its creation. The first one is clearly visible and easily understandable despite the complexity of its inner workings. It could be called fashion, trend, fad, dernier cri, zeitgeist, or anything that denotes the peculiar phenomenon of some things being in and some things out. As if a gigantic collective mind were making global decisions apparently randomly. The child emperor with unlimited psychic powers. Now that's a scary thought. This child controls the world of commercial music with a dictator's mandate, but it would be naive to claim that we, creators and interpreters of what uncomfortably is still called classical music, would be free of its massive influence. Things might work a little more under the surface in our world, but immune we are not. Whatever the laws of this mecha mechanism are, they are well beyond my abilities to explain or even describe, so let's concentrate on the second category, which is more topical and easier to analyze, although no, completely, not completely independent of the first. There have been moments in history when a group of ideologically and aesthetically like-minded composers have decided to write a new book of rules, to promote it aggressively and create clearly delineated categories of right and wrong, these categories are mostly synonymous with good and bad, but not always. Sometimes the ideological, ideological value completely eclipses the aesthetic one, mostly when music is being used as a tool for propaganda in totalitarian societies, but also when reading statements by Boulez from the 50s, one can see that the idea of truth as an overriding artistic value sometimes is appealing to mostly young people, 
even in the free societies. Since the Viennese discoveries, any musician who has not experienced, I do not say understood, but truly experienced, the necessity of the dodecaphonic language is useless, for his entire work brings him up short of the needs of his time. This is an actual quote from Huet. If you replace any musician who has not experienced the necessity of the dodecaphonic language with something like any composer who does not accept the importance of educating and motivating the masses, you get something which is very close to the criteria that was used to criticize Shostakovich, Prokofiev, and Khachaturian for formalism in the Zdanov decree at the infamous con con Congress of the Soviet Composers Union in 1948. Today, many of the rules and taboos of the Darmstadtians seem absurd and often downright funny. Octaves and major and minor chords were forbidden. Regular pulse is forbidden. Melody is forbidden. What is not funny is the fact that in many places in Europe, there still is a certain blind faith and adherence to the principles set by the young composers directly after the war. In Germany, France, Italy, and Austria, good and serious new music, as understood by large parts of the establishment, still springs from the legacy of serialism, with some local color, for sure, but the no-nos seem to be the same. Some years ago, I conducted a program in Munich uh, with the ex excellent uh, Bavarian Radio Symphony Orchestra with music by Anders Hilbo, <coughs> Steven Stucky, Michael Spinberg, and myself in the Musica Nova series. There was a, there was a highly in, intriguing review in the Süddeutsche Zeitung saying that while this music was basically okay, it was more ABO music and not Neue Musik. This was an absolutely baffling distinction. ABO Musik means music that can, play, can, that can be played in subscription concerts for a generally older, well-heeled audience. ABO stands for Abonnement, subscription, Abo. Uh, while Neue Musik, new music, is something these people would not pay for hearing. This resembles the fractured, fractured tribalism of the rock, pop, hip-hop world. One of the fundamental axioms of the modernist project in music was that a rigid scientific, i.e. something that can be proven true or false, organization of all or as many as possible parameters of music would almost automatically elevate the composition to a higher level by the unbroken chain of evidence. What a naive and simplistic thought. What on earth is a parameter in music? Pitch and duration, yes, but timbre and dynamics. A chef needs a piece of fish and tomatoes, not molecular formula. All research is potentially good, but to simplify the complex and deep experience of music to parameters. Give me a break. The quest of the Darmstadt boys, there were virtually no girls, uh, was essentially the same as always for at least a millennium, to find a shortcut to value and greatness. And they failed, but not without some compelling results of the way. Just think of Stockhausen's Gruppen or various Epiphany. Lodov Zavsky told me once that he had discovered a set of simple rules that allowed him to write good music. I was young then and wanted to know them right away. He was very amused by my excitement and promised to reveal the secret some other time. <laughs> he, he passed away before we had that conversation. I now understand that he meant a simple matrix for organizing pitches, that's all. The other big questions of rhythm, color and form were not dealt with by this neat little machine. Those were left for Vito himself to solve. And how beautifully he solved them. I still miss him very much and think of him often. It is tempting to think that the artistic value of music 
would be somehow governed or at least related to the laws of nature. There are numerous attempts to organize musical material according to the golden ratio, both the macro form and the pitch and rhythm material itself. Bartok reputedly arranged the formal structure in his later, later works um, according to this fascinating irrational mathematical constant. Not everybody agrees. The Finnish Bartok scholar Ayat Gaurama is not con convinced about that. He thinks it is an after construction, not based on Bartok's real intentions. The evidence is tautological, as practically every, every whole can be represented as a division by the golden ratio. It is always easier to create a system that adjusts, adjusts itself to reality than creating reality itself, as the creator of the system can choose with which aspects of reality will be included. Very useful. The Danish composer Van Nergård has used, used the golden ratio formula sometimes very successfully. He devised also a never-repeating series which he called Infinity Series, which produced pitches, pitches in forever new constellations. One of my favorite pieces from Nergaard's early Uwe is Voyage into the Golden Screen, which it is one of the first examples of any music consciously structured strictly according to universal natural ratios. Perhaps the most obvious natural phenomenon that can be used as a structural foundation in music is the harmonic series. Half of our beloved and deeply hated tonal system is based on it. I say half, as the problem of the minor chord, which cannot easily be explained based on the series, has given a great deal of trouble to musicologists for centuries. The movement that, that was to be called musique spectral, spectral music, much to the irritation of its creators Gérard Grisier and Tristan Duvain, began in Paris in the 70s. The starting point of each piece was a more or less complex harmonic series, which would dictate all elements of music. The best examples of spectral music managed indeed to create a fascinating organic feel, as if the music really was something not man-made, but organic, objective, and often beautiful. Sibelius was one of the heroes for Grisin. That was a very unusual position in France those days. It still is. All this was a manifestation of the dream of finding some universal principles to ensure validity. As always, the best, most talented, dare we say, musical, composers wrote important works, whatever the guiding principle was. And the lesser ones, how many times have we witnessed new music where the process has been confused with content, the rule of law with quality, and the system with expression? As the aesthetics of mainstream new music started to get more diffused both in Europe and the east coast of the US, a new magic formula appeared on the stage, world music, globalism the use of material way beyond the composer's own background and culture. This was nothing new in itself. Debussy was deeply impressed by a Gamelin group at the Paris World Expo in 1989. 1889, sorry. And Orientalism has been a fixture of French music since. It's easy to understand reasons behind the renewed interest in ethnic material at a point where modernism has run out of steam. The internet changed everything. A vast number of sound archives were available to everybody just a few clicks away. Using folk music as source material for composition was not only an aesthetic choice. I'm convinced that subconsciously, or indeed fully intentionally, the global approach seemed to offer some kind of validation again. Folk music must be good, as it is created, created spontaneously, without any external commercial or political agendas. There is an interesting dualism between Western and Asian composers in this respect. While many Asians are emphasizing their ethnic and cultural background by using folk material and sometimes instruments from home, Europeans tend to seek alien material 
uh, Europeans tend to seek aid at both both. Either way, the risks are the same. It's very difficult to create a syntax where the other culture becomes more than just a spotlight to draw attention to itself. We know that for many composers, a sudden intense contact with otherness has been a, a decisive moment in their development. But only the best ones manage to, manage to create an organic language from the clash and conflict with alien material. The lesser ones produce some kind of tourism, musical postcards, amusing collages at best. Almost 20 years ago, I heard Simha Arom's recordings of the music of West African pygmy tribes. I was very taken and moved by the hypnotic quality of the chants, the tenderness of the lullabies, and the energy of the offbeat rhythm, and set out to transcribe some of that music into Western notation. I was planning to use the transcribed songs in an orchestra piece. It turned out to be an impossible task. Not the transcription itself, it was actually very easy to write down the simple melodic patterns and harmonies that were not functional but seemed to come from simple parallel movements. The problem was that our standard notation captured nothing, absolutely nothing of this beautiful stuff. It was a completely wrong tool for the job. What I had on paper was clumsy, square and utterly uninteresting, devoid of any, any expression, any identity. Everything powerful and arresting about this music was between lines, hopelessly beyond reach. Transcription between cultures is incredibly difficult and in many cases impossible. Composers are left with copy and paste option, inserting other music as ends. This works rarely as we have seen and heard. There is also a disturbing post-colonialist aspect to all this. We might use South Indian Carnatic music as material for our composition without appreciating and understanding its own history, grammar and syntax. In this case, the world music approach produces a souvenir, a plastic miniature of Taj Mahal, which is good for nothing else but throwing it at a crook of a prime minister. I'm referring to Silvio Berlusconi, <laughs> a couple of years ago in Italy got a, a, a plastic model of the, the Duomo of Milan thrown at him. Um, and luckily the, the guy who threw it at him didn't miss him completely. <laughs> I'm tempted to say uh, that to some degree a true, accurate, and honest translation between cultures is impossible. And in any case, it does not provide automatically added value to our artistic endeavors. You might be asking yourselves at this point, if none of these recipes can offer the desired result, what can? There, there is, of course, no magic spell. Composers are artisans, makers of aesthetic objects. There are no Harry Potters among us. Value and relevance has to be earned, as Louis Andreessen and Elmer Schoenberger write in their excellent book, Apollonia Clockwork. You have to sweat over every note, agonize over every minute detail and decision. That's what composing is making thousands or millions of micro-level decisions that eventually produce this wondrous phenomenon we call music. It's worth it. There is no shortcut. I want to end this speech by simply quoting my Italian teacher, Franco Donatoni. Lavorare, 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 sempre lavorare. Work, 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 always. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, just a 
few words about the violin concerto. Um, I'm not going to analyze it uh, or anything like that at the moment. Life is too short. Um, <laughs> but I wrote it in most parts uh, of the piece was written in 2008. Uh, and I finished it a few minutes before the first rehearsal in 2009. Um, and two things were happening in 2008. Um, first, I, I turned 50. And when, when you're 50 years old, there's no way to... Uh, there's no way to think you're a youngster. That's it. <laughs> you know, the number is there. So you should know your stuff. You should know what you're doing. Uh, and you know, buying a Harley Davidson or buying a or going uh, hang gliding or something like that, it doesn't help. <laughs> it is what it is. However, speaking of age, I have to tell you the story about Nicholas Slonimsky, who was the uh, uh, Russian uh, uh, composer and conductor who emigrated from St. Petersburg in 1917 and ended up in, in LA. And he lived there until the end of his days, and, and he, he turned 100 one day. And um, I went to see him, and he was very, very depressed. I said, Nicholas, what's wrong? I said, you're in a great shape, and you're 100. He said, yeah, you know, when it's impossible to pretend to be young when your age has three digits. <laughs> so, you know, still, way, way to go. Um, the, the other poignant thing that was happening at the, at the time I, I was writing this piece was that, that I had, had decided to step down in LA and, um, and move my, my family back to Europe uh, after 17 very, very good years in Los Angeles. Very enjoyable, very exciting. Um, and that actually turned out to be a much bigger event in my life than I thought because it was much more than just ending a, a, a professional relationship. It, the orchestra had become, become like a family and, and I had seen you know, uh, young musicians I had hired, I had seen them grow and, and you know, get married and, and, and have their first children. I had seen the kids grow and all that. You know, it, it, it was much more than, than just a professional relationship. And, um, and somehow the violin concerto reflects some of that turmoil. Um, and the last movement is called Adieu, and um, um, it's not a farewell to anything in particular, um, apart from maybe my previous life. Um, and what is maybe um, significant is that the very last chord of the piece has harmonically nothing to do with anything else in the piece. Um, and I wanted to put it there, and I, I was wondering myself why does it feel so important that this chord is at the end of this piece, and I, I realized that the newness of it, the sort of disconnection, disconnect between the existing material and, and the chord, meant that it, that it was about the future, of which we know nothing, of course. But that was like the door I had opened, and now I had to enter. And that's what the court says, basically. Um, Lila Josefovic, who is the soloist of the video uh, from Paris, um, she has been quite incredible. Um, she came to the first rehearsal of this piece in LA and played everything from memory. In the middle of the first run-through, she says, why, why is the second oval not playing? <laughs> and I said, oh, oops, sorry. Um, <laughs> So she, she has been operating on that, that level, and uh, last week we played the piece in, in uh, Boston a few times, and uh, now she's on a well-deserved maternity leave, um, about to have her second child in about four weeks. Um, this piece would not have happened without her. So this is from Paris, the Théâtre de Châtelet, uh, the French Radio Symphony Orchestra, playing Lila, as the soul is that I put back in myself.
soloists on that level. Your music lives like any music. Uh, um, she, she plays this piece with the same kind of dedication and panache as other people play the Brahms or Beethoven or something. And, and of course, new music comes to life. It's convincing when the musician has this sort of commitment. Um, so I'm lucky. And, um, if you have any questions, I'm yes. happy to answer. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, she she's completely inside the music, but there's no nothing is calculated. Everything comes from within. Absolutely. I have some structural questions about you. That orchestra placement on stage is that your choice? I mean, you put the violas out front on the right of you. Uh, is that something that they've been doing, or is that that's how the the French radio symphony orchestra sits okay, normally, so and that's. Exactly. The choice of their chief conductors. I mostly, when I go and guest conduct, I don't mess with uh, their seating arrangement because it's destructive. <laughs> Gentle little swipe at Piavores. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, I deeply, deeply respect him and love him. And, and he's been incredibly helpful. He was he supported my work when I was young. So I'm not gonna publish it. Uh, I can read it and, <laughs> and <laughs> you can tweet about it, but <laughs> <laughs> but it's, I'm not going to publish it until later. churning butter. That's what we all do every day, right? Yeah. Um, so I mostly I just collect material bits and pieces even when I'm not officially composing. Um, even in the middle of a very busy conducting period I might just jot something down. And it's partly a practical thing, thing because when I then finally have my composing period I don't want to be facing the famous white paper, which is so uh, scary. So I, I always have something already. Little, you know, scraps of paper, paper and some ideas I just carry in my head and so on and so forth. But not, I never ever start from sort of zero. Um, and most of these little things I've written down are of no value, uh, but then some little things might have some germs of uh, something else. And then starts what is like the churn and butter process. And if you've ever witnessed this, um, it's kind of interesting because you churn and churn and churn and churn and nothing happens. For, for a very long time you see no change in the cons consistency of the liquid. And then after a while, little grains start to appear. And from that point to solid butter, it goes really quickly. Um, it's the same thing, I guess this has to do with liquid dynamics generally, because if you, uh, well, I guess here in Kentucky you don't see it, but, but, uh, but when a, a lake freezes over, that's also one of those processes that For a very long time, seemingly nothing happens, and you see these little um, isolated uh, bits and pieces of ice appear that goes very quickly. So it, my process is very much like that, that, that I keep churning and nothing happens, and I go crazy every time. Um, and then one day, the <coughs> elements 
find their sort of interrelationships and, and, and they start belonging together somehow. Um, and then I start seeing how what how the form is gonna gonna be. So these things want to be together and these things seem to belong to that part of the piece. And then after a while I I have the shape clear in my mind and, and then I know what is missing and what has to be discarded and, and um, so on and so forth. So it's um, it's not like an architect who conceives the total scope of the house first and then goes into details. I quite often start from, start from the details and then the house, the shape of the house becomes clear to me halfway through. Um, nine months, more or less, um, which is a sort of a nice coincidence. Well, conducting a new piece is kind of difficult because um, mostly we have very little rehearsal time and then, then I play through a new piece and then I have to make lots of decisions in a very short time. And first rehearsal is always awful, even with the best orchestras, because um, what they don't read first time round is the dynamic. So everything comes out as sort of uniformly loud. And you think, okay, my God, I've destroyed the balance and I, how can I not do this? Um, and uh, the best method to avoid that particular panic is not to go to the first rehearsal. But, but, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure I should say this in front of uh, Young colleagues, but but my first composition teacher Raudemar said that don't go to the first rehearsal. If you must, don't go sober. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> just eradicate that, okay? Um, and uh, but of course, if you are conducting, you you kind of have to be disciplined. Um, and then. I have learned not to make any major changes in the first rehearsal. After the second one, yeah, if necessary. But the, the, the difference between the first and second rehearsal is, is magic, magical quite often. So things kind of gel automatically and also musicians learn automatically, intuitively, they hear what is important, what, what isn't. And uh, what I'm doing is not the main voice, so I back up a little bit, and vice versa. And this, with good musicians, and musicians generally, they, I think we should trust their intuition quite often. Um, new pieces, in, at least in my case, they come out in two different ways. Either they come out fairly complete, um, like an egg, like this fiddle concerto, one of those things where I changed nothing, um, apart from some little dynamics, but not nothing, uh, not one note. Um, and then other pieces that just give me endless trouble, and I keep changing and revising, and my publishers go mad, and my editor uh, uh, doesn't answer my phone calls anymore, and, and you know that kind of thing. It, so you just never know. Do you find it easier or perhaps uh, more enjoyable to conduct your own pieces if you don't need to study it to understand it? You know, um, I, I did make this mistake when I was younger a few times that I thought, okay, I wrote this piece so I don't have to learn it. It doesn't work that way. Um, I, 
every time I've written a piece, I go to my studio and learn it as a conductor. It's two different things. And the reason for that is that the human brain can only handle so much data at any given moment. I mean, the bandwidth is limited. And I guess we have different bandwidths, but, but by and large we are all the same. Um, so, if you wrote an orchestra piece, you have too much data in your head. You, you, because you, you know the history of every note you, you wrote. So, when this music starts to move in real time, you don't know what the heck is going on, because all this data comes at you. And yet, there's the, the one thing that you didn't have when you wrote it, which is the sort of um, unforgiving time. Things that happened are in the past. And, of course, when you sit there with the score, you can always go back. Um, and when we learn a piece as a conductor, we, we, what we do is to, we learn the timeline. And then around that timeline, we kind of build the, our knowledge of the details and all the elements of the piece. But, but I don't think anybody can carry an entire symphony orchestra score, every detail of it at any given moment, plus be able to move hands and breathe and, you know, keep the sort of central nervous system and functions going at the same, same, same time. I don't, I don't think it's possible. So what we do is that we make a reduction. We make some kind of a reduction, reduction uh, that we then can handle in real time. So that there's not... The, the CPU doesn't overheat. And if I write a piece, it doesn't mean that I have the, the necessary reduction to, to be able to conduct it. So that's what I meant. That's the short answer. Right? These days I do, yeah, yeah. Um, I was kind of suspicious of it for a long time, and um, and of course then when I started using computer notation, I the first program I bought was Finale One Point Something, <laughs> which was an absolute mess. <laughs> um, but anyway, you know, you would transpose a couple of pages of, of score, and it would take eight hours, and you would go and sleep, and then you would wake up in the morning and it had crashed. And not only crashed, but it had somehow corrupted the entire hard drive, <laughs> all 126k of it. And uh, so I thought that in my 20s that life is not long enough for this kind of stuff. So then I, I, would, I didn't use computer for a while. And then the software actually proved beyond recognition. I think I went back to Finale when it was four points on it. Uh, and then I've been with Sibelius since the beginning. And now um, I couldn't actually imagine life without, without especially Sibelius because it, I travel so much and I have all my material on the MacBook Air. This is not an Apple endorsement, by the way. Um, uh, and, and it weighs two pounds. And, um, I open it and I'm in the middle, which is great. And instead of carrying these suitcases full of paper. <laughs> um, so I miss the tactile aspect of writing music and I, I miss the sort of um, certain kind of freedom that pencil and paper give you. But, but also, I think we, we should just accept the fact that, that MIDI today is what piano used to be for Chopin. So it's just the instrument we use. So, and that in itself has no value added or uh, detracted. It, it's just a, it's just a tool. Please. I don't quite know what it means even because. Um, I cannot believe that I would be able to create music out of vacuum. Music that would somehow not be in 
related to music that my predecessors have created or my contemporaries create. Um, and, um, and I think that when we look at the biggest breakthroughs in history of music, and now I'm referring to pieces like Be My Romance, uh, St. Matthew Passion, uh, Eroica, Symphony Fantastique, uh, um, Salome, Rite of Spring, those kind of pieces. Mostly, you can tell what the formula is from which they depart. But the departure would be kind of meaningless without the formula existing. Um, so I think this art form in particular um, has a sort of built-in intertextual element. So music is quite, quite often dialogue in other music. Um, even if we don't intend that to be the case, because that's how we are wired as listeners. Um, so we, we, we search for patterns um, from our own experience. And then the actual musical experience is, is the kind of interplay between the, the patterns and what may not be any recognizable pattern in our experience. And that's where the experience of newness um, comes, if, if it comes. Um, and in terms of what is new and what is old, I think what we should accept the fact that the kind of European high modernism as introduced in the late 40s and the 50s and that carried on into the 60s and 70s and so on and so forth, that's also a historic period. Um, so, but there's still a kind of a confusion in terms of uh, what is being called new music, especially in Europe. This country is a little more open in that way, but um, if there's a piece that completely and utterly uh, is based on the principles as established by, say, Boulez Nono and um, Roman Haubenstock Ramati in 1952, that is considered new music. Um, it was a while ago, you know. Um, so I think one should widen the idea of, of what is really tradition and what isn't. We have time for about one more question. What was your own answer? I was a home player. One of those, you know. <laughs> one that got away. <laughs> Yes, say that very little would be written today without permission. Um, because, you know, a composer... Composing is one of the worst paid professions in the world. I mean, the, if somebody writes an orchestra piece and gets a sort of a average composing commissioning fee, I think the hourly rate is way, way, way below the minimum wage, <laughs> legal minimum wage in any state of the state. Um, and I, it's sadly not a job, but that's, that's how, how it goes. So commissioning is absolutely vital to the survival and future of the, the kind of music we represent. And in terms of how much it limits the composer, you know, of course, if the commissioner wants to have 20 minutes for orchestra, then if you deliver 16 or 24, that's fine. Half an hour is okay. But I think the funniest commission uh, uh, process I've heard of was when uh, Kuzelitsky commissioned uh, young Olivier Messiaen, uh, a 15-minute orchestra piece. 
unless your sense first movement or what was later to be known as the Coronavirus Symphony, uh, which is about, I don't know, seven minutes. There's a second movement. Uh, four. Finally, the tenth movement comes. And the symphony is about 80 minutes long at that point. And Kusevitsky used to have two guys, young boys, play the piano for him. He, he didn't, he was not a very good score reader and he couldn't play the piano very well. So he had two young boys to play the piano for him, uh, Lukas Foss and Lenny Bernstein. <laughs> and and he, was, he was to sit in a rocking chair, kind of rocking back and forth and listening to the boys play. And uh, so it was Lenny's turn to play the new commission for Kusevitsky. He starts banging Toronto Little Symphony on the piano. So after 40 minutes, Kusevitsky says, Lenny, you think, I think you should conduct this new piece. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.